Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction House taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming Fall of 2018 firearms auction. And today we're taking a look at one of the early guns designed by one Gordon Ingram. This is a Police Ordnance Company Model 6. Uh, Ingram, of course, would go on to be far better known for the Mac-10 submachine gun, kind of infamous in its own way. Um, and he would have a long list of other projects, but this is his first really successful one. So uh, Ingram was a rifleman in World War II, he was a combat vet, and he came back from the war with this idea that he really thought he could start a company and manufacture some really good guns that could sell internationally um, military and police type firearms. So. Uh, he came back and proceeded to attempt to do just that. In 1946 he came out with his M5 submachine gun. He, by the way, looked at the US military and there was, the US had the M3 grease gun, the M3 submachine gun, and he figured, well, they might be adopting something new that would be the M4, so we'll leave M4 and then I'll use the name M5 to give this thing a cool military connotation. Well, the M5 wasn't successful, it went nowhere. Uh, shortly thereafter he also introduced, or tried to design, uh, his, what he called the M20, which was a light machine gun, looked rem vaguely reminiscent of uh, a German MG42, but it was actually just a simple blowback uh, system. And it technically worked, the bolt was heavy enough to work as a blowback in a rifle caliber, but that was going nowhere and never went into production, you know, one or two prototypes only built. And after that he came back to the submachine gun side and developed the M6, which would actually be successful. Uh, one interesting little anecdote here, while developing his submachine guns, Ingram actually got into correspondence with Aimo Lati. Uh, he had found a Suomi submachine gun and didn't have a magazine for it, and so, well what do you do in the days before the internet? Well, you write to Finland and see if the guy who designed the gun can get you a magazine. And they corresponded back and forth. Lottie ended up sending him a magazine, but this was after World War II. It ended up being a stick magazine. Uh, he'd really been looking for a drum magazine, I think. At any rate, Ingram actually attempted to sponsor Lottie's uh, immigration and naturalization into the United States at the time. Uh, that was, of course, turned down because of Finland's connections to Nazi Germany. Didn't go anywhere. Lottie stayed in Finland. But uh, going, coming back to our, our Model 6 here, uh, in 1948 this was introduced at the International Police Chiefs Convention in Sacramento, and, uh, and just a year later, shortly thereafter in 1949, Ingram and uh, some fellow investors put their money together and created the Police Ordnance Company to manufacture and distribute this gun. Now they had a couple different versions of it. Uh, they had a guard model, a police model, and a military model. And this one is actually marked police, which I'll show you, but it is a guard model. There is some, some mixing and matching like that that went on. The guard model had a smooth barrel and a horizontal foregrip like this. There was also a police model, which is even more reminiscent of the Thompson submachine gun. Obviously that's what this design is looking to invoke. And the police model had a finned barrel like a, like a pre-war Thompson, and a vertical front grip like a pre-war Thompson. Uh, the military pattern had a smooth barrel, but then it had a couple extra military kind of bits. It had sling swivels, which we do actually see on this one. Uh, it had a fully protected front sight. It was fitted for a bayonet, which was basically a nine inch long nail. It was a spike bayonet that just fit in a hole under the, the uh, front sight. But, eh, you know, bayonet, military pattern. And um, they, would, they would make some successes. So before we talk about where these sold and how many of them sold, let's take a closer look at the actual mechanics of how this thing works, because it's pretty simple. Alright, so Ingram Model 6. This obviously is meant to look like a Thompson, but it is far simpler than a Thompson. Um, interestingly, something you don't generally notice from just pictures, it's also quite a bit narrower than the Thompson. This is a, a pretty compact gun to handle, uh, more so than I was expecting when I first picked it up. Um, it is also a lot lighter than the Thompson. The Thompson came in at uh, basically 11 pounds, like 5 kilos, 4.9 kilos. Uh, this guy is 3.3 kilos, that's 7 and a quarter pounds, so 3, 3, and, three and a half pounds lighter than a Thompson gun. That's a big difference. Um, and the reason is this was designed after World War II with the, the, the understanding that had been gained of, look, submachine guns can be really simple, doesn't have to be a lot in it. Simple blowback, tubular sort of receiver, sheet metal parts. These are things that, that weren't really common knowledge in 1919 when the Thompson gun was designed. 
Anyway, moving on. All of the markings are up here on the front of the receiver. So Ingram patent pending, very early one. This is serial number 227. It is Police Ordnance Company. There we go, Police Ordnance. Located in Los Angeles, California. And you can see the model number at the very bottom there. It's pretty light, but it says M6 Police 45 ACP. Uh, according to the Police Ordnance Company's catalog, you could also buy these guns in 9mm Parabellum or 38 Super. In reality, they made, I think, four of one and nine of the other in those calibers. They were sales samples and demo guns only, and there were never any orders for those. All of the all the Model 6s that were actually produced uh, and sold were 45 ACP ones. In 45 ACP, these use a proprietary uh, double stack, double feed, 30 round stick magazine. Some people are going to wonder, well, why would you do a proprietary magazine? Well, the answer is there weren't a whole lot of good options. Uh, you really, in the US, you had two options for a 45 caliber uh, submachine gun that you might take the magazines from. One is the Thompson. And remember, the Thompson is this very early design, and it's got this giant T-shaped rail on the back of the magazine, which is expensive to make, and it gets in the way. And when you have a magazine release like this, that's just a simple latch and a nice simple box, uh, you're better off designing your own mag than trying to use that, that, that old-fashioned Thompson mag. The other option would be the, the M3 grease gun, but yeah, this is 19. This is still in the late 1940s. There aren't exactly grease guns on the commercial market. There aren't a lot of those magazines available, and using that magazine wouldn't really have been much assistance to a police agency or a prison that didn't have access to them. So, uh, police ordnance company in Ingram designed their own magazine. It is a little bit awkward here because it's actually kind of tricky to tell uh, which one, which end is the front end. You know the the. I can very easily see someone mixing that up. And so I believe actually some of the later magazines had an arrow on them pointing towards the front. These are pretty rare magazines today. Police Ordnance Company never had the, the cash reserves to place a big order for magazines, so instead they kind of tended to order them <coughs> a couple at a time as guns were purchased. Uh, guns generally didn't weren't ordered with a lot of extra magazines, so it's pretty cool to have one with the gun, of course. Um, but if if you own a Model 6, you probably already know this, but uh, finding extra magazines can be a little tricky. Mechanically, this is just simple blowback. So, fires from an open bolt, pull the trigger, bolt drops, fires the cartridge, and it just cycles back and forth until you release the trigger. There is a safety notch here that you can lift the bolt handle up into to lock it in the open position. Uh, however, the other safety mechanisms that we would typically look for on a submachine gun, uh, things like a mechanism to prevent the bolt from coming back and picking up a cartridge if it's dropped on the buttstock, none of those things exist. This is a, a very simplistic design. We can take it apart by just removing the screwed on rear end cap. There's a little tab here that locks it in place. So once I've got that started, we can just unscrew this. The spring will kind of pop this thing out. You have to be a little careful. And boing! There we go. Spring comes out. Then the bolt handle comes back here, and you rotate the bolt handle up into that safety notch, and then you can remove the bolt handle. And then you can slide the bolt out. Nothing particularly complicated going on here. This is just a big solid mass. Your sear engagement surface is right there. That's what the fire control group uh, holds onto. There's the hole for the bolt handle. just goes clean through it. We have a fixed firing pin up front, extractor on the top, and a cutout on the bottom for a fixed ejector. And that's it. Uh, the rear of the bolt is turned down slightly so that the recoil spring fits over it. And that's, that's all you got. There is no fire selector, there is no safety switch. Your safety is leave the bolt closed on, and, and empty, or lock it open here. Uh, the trigger is full auto only. You know, what more do you want?
Uh, the later guns had aperture rear sights, but this is one of the early ones that actually uses a King's uh, revolver sight. They took a buckhorn style revolver sight and drilled uh, an aperture into it. Sight's a little tricky to use, so uh, we'll see how that goes on the range later on. The front sight is just a square post. What's kind of cool about it though is, well, or interesting about it, I don't know that this is really a selling point, but rather than mill a block here or cast one, what they did is actually just stack up about six or eight plates of uh, sheet metal cut to the same profile, and uh, tack them together, and presto, you have a front sight block. There are two screws uh, here, one on the bottom of the trigger guard, one behind the magazine well. Those are what connect the, uh, the, the lower body of the gun to the actual receiver, so I've already loosened those. We can pull, pull them out. Now we'll leave that guy in there because, presto, there's your, uh, your fire control group. Really nothing to it. Just pulls the sear down. This part in the back is actually the trigger, and you can see that's also manufactured of a, a bunch of stacked plates. Although the sear itself, because it does require hardening, that's uh, a milled component there. Pretty much nothing else going on in the, the lower assembly. And then the receiver itself is just a simple tube with some cutouts. So we've got a cutout for the trigger and the ejector, cutout for the magazine well, a pair of welded on studs so that you can attach the lower frame. The front handguard is just attached with a couple more screws uh, into the barrel. Well, this one's attached to another threaded, another stud welded onto the bottom of the receiver there. That's, that is it. There's your fixed ejector. You can see that was drilled through, uh, hole drilled in the receiver, put the ejector in, and then tack weld it in place so that it stays there. All right, so what actually happened to this? How many of these were made? Obviously they went into some sort of production because we've got one here, full auto, registered, and legal. Well, uh, in 1951 the U.S. Marine Corps actually tested the gun, or it was tested for them. Yeah, they weren't particularly impressed, they didn't buy them. You can certainly understand why. Uh, the biggest sale actually ended up being to Peru. Uh, the Peruvian government bought like 400 of these, and more importantly, they came up with a licensing agreement because they wanted to make them in Peru. And so Ingram actually traveled to Peru and spent some time aiding the Peruvian government. They set up a factory and apparently something like 8,000 of these were manufactured under license in Peru. Not bad for what it is, and, and the income from that certainly would help uh, Ingram go on with uh, his other designs later in life, I'm sure. Uh, in total in the United States about 2,000 of these guns were manufactured total. So not a huge number, not a complete flop though. Um, you got to give Ingram some credit for that. Uh, they were sold to police and basically police agencies and prisons. So of course they had the guard model which was intended for prison guards. They didn't market these to private individuals. They could have legally sold them to private individuals. I don't think they did. I think they really specifically focused on sales just to law enforcement uh, for these guns. And um, that's that's pretty much it. By 1953 or 54, Ingram, uh, I'm sorry, in 53, Ingram decided to leave the company. There were some financial arguments going on. And in 54, police ordnance company folded uh, and disappeared forever. So Ingram would of course go on to develop uh, his, his other guns, his Model 10 submachine gun in particular, which of course would become quite notorious, famous, recognizable, whatever, whatever adjective you want to use to cover the Mac 10. So uh, we'll cover Ingram's other guns later on in different videos, but I thought it'd be really cool to take a look at this one today, one of his very early, in fact his very first I think we can call it successful uh, submachine gun designs. So if you'd like to own this yourself, it is a registered, legal, full auto, NFA, transferable submachine gun. Uh, it is coming up for sale here at the Morphe Auction House. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to Forgotten Weapons, and from there uh, a link over to Morphe's catalog page where you can take a look at their description, their pictures, uh, everything else, their price estimate, everything else you'd want to know about it. And uh, I think we are going to go ahead and take this out to the range and do some shooting with it as well. So stick around for that video. Thanks for watching.